this is uh, Fred Terzian, and uh, you might know him from Sam or uh, Oakland Cloud Dusters. But he gave, I guess he gave a very similar talk at his, been here, uh, been here before. his meeting. But um, I have always been interested in free flight, and, and um, I thought I'd share my little story. So, Eric, keep, keep focused here. Oh, shit. Forget Fred for 30, 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so, I was a kid who built a stick and, and tissue plane, and I just loved it. I just thought, this is so cool, and, I, and it was rubber powered because I couldn't afford an engine. And, but I just thought, well, this, I can't do this hobby because radios at that time, I think were about $5,000 in today's money, maybe even 10. It was just unbelievably expensive. And so I just gave up on this hobby that obviously I've, I've loved ever, you know, ever since I've been an adult. So I just wish somebody said, you know, there's a such thing as free flight and, you know, let me tell you some, some ideas about it. And then, and then flash forward like 40 years later, I was in Minnesota doing a college tours with my son, and, um, and I had some time to kill, and so I looked up some glider events to see if there's anything I could look at, and, and I found a free flight contest at a sod farm in uh, Minnesota, and um, it was just such a cool event. You know, a sod farm is like heaven for glider pilots, but then free flight just takes advantage of all that space, and it just is a real freeing experience to watch these uh, planes go. So. Um, Fred has a lot of things to show us, and some, I think you'll be really interested in how they launch them and how they get them back down and how they judge the contest. So let's uh, take it away, Fred. All right, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for inviting me back. Sure. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this, uh, I did a little bit of a talk for Sam 21 here uh, about a month or so ago, and um, uh, the obvious is that when you have a different kind of concept or design, people all of a sudden gravitate towards it because they said, what the heck is it? You know, they have no idea what it is. Well, this is a really good example of it because this is actually a, a, a class that is very uh, limited flying here in the United States. It's flown very much in Europe. It's, uh, again, you know the FAI categories and FALs. This is called F1E. And it stands really for magnetic steering gliders, which are actually launched very much like what you guys do, with the exception that we don't have the ready to control part of it, off of a hill, off of a slope, somewhere high, not necessarily a mountain, but not necessarily a small hill. The advantage um, in the location that you pick has to do with retrieval because obviously you have to re you know you have to go back up to the top of the hill to put in your next flight, your next round or whatever. So what happens with this particular class? Uh, it was actually started uh, by a German by the name of Hans Grimmer, and I know it was before 1960 or so. And it just turns out that I happened to come across a model aviation newsletter uh, from 1961 and why I picked that one up, I was looking through it, and then lo and behold, here was this vein steering article, and it was actually giving a, a good example of how this class uh, was, uh, was started. So I can pass some in that direction and some over here in this, and if there isn't enough copies or whatever, or if you're interested, fine, just go ahead and pass them on to the next person. Um, basically what we're talking about here is a class which actually has quite a bit of latitude in terms of how you build it, how large it can be, and uh, what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, so with all FAI categories, it's limited, you know, sometimes with the amount of wingspan, uh, it has to weigh a certain amount. In this particular case, it can't be over a certain amount of weight. But you'll see that this one here in particular, even though it looks large in comparison to some of the other ones that I'll show you later, is actually maybe middle of the road, small. Um, but it's intended to fly in relatively um, thermal type conditions. Uh, the airfoil, again, is not necessarily up to date. Uh, this airplane was actually uh, manufactured by a Romanian by the name of Daniel Petcu back around 2000, 2001. In fact, the sticker that you see on there actually says 2001. I acquired it about uh, six or seven years ago from a person in uh, uh, New Mexico who had brought back about five or six of these, you know, when he went to a world championship event over there in, in uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, so he was basically trying to get the hobby involved over here. Now the problem with free flight, as you probably already know, is that number one, you have to have uh, plenty of land, you know, with unobstructed uh, things, no houses, no trees, no power lines, uh, preferably uh, flat areas, and in this case, you know, hills is, is uh, best. It has on the front vane here 
a magnetic uh, uh, capsule. In fact, I'll go ahead and pass this one around because this one here is for another size airplane so you can actually see the magnet in there. So the magnet <coughs> points towards magnetic north and then the vane, depending on the orientation of the magnets inside, will move this one here to orient the airplane in the direction that you want it to fly. The obvious is that the wind never always comes from true magnetic north. You know, So if you can't launch it directly into true magnetic north, you have to make an adjustment in order, to in order to compensate for that. So let's say if the airplane is, or I should say if the wind is coming from the west, then you have to orient the magnet in there, and so it's got like a, uh, a shaft here with a friction fit on there, so you can hold this vane and then pull it you know, in one direction or the other to get the magnet facing magnetic north. Once you've done that, the airplane will track very, very well into the wind, and it'll stay in that track. The only thing that'll disturb it will be a thermal. And the thermal will generally pull it in a particular direction. It'll start to crab in one direction or, or, or another. But then that vane will eventually reestablish it back into the proper direction of where the wind is coming from. And uh, so you'll see that when these airplanes are actually launched, we use um, uh, temperature gauges. We look at uh, mylar streamers that are put up you know, a, a couple of hundred yards in advance of where we are. Because if the thermal is here when you launch, it's already too late. And uh, so therefore, you're going to go into probably cold air, and then the airplane's going to start to settle down and maybe not catch another thermal. So the idea is to try and catch that thermal before it's actually arrived at where you're launching it from. And so the airplane, again, is just launched in that particular attitude outward. Today, uh, they're not using mechanical timers like they used to for the dethermalization process. This is why you probably see that this is, uh, that's the normal mode, obviously. And then when you want to bring it down after it's got its maximum flight, you do, you know, you bring it up to about a 45 degree angle, then it settles down. For this particular class, because of its weight and size, it's probably better to let it fly until it hits the ground. You know, you suffer less damage going, you know, in that direction and then eventually landing in that, even though there might be some brush or something else that's going to impede its progress. Um, so they're flown in rounds. Uh, five rounds is the current. Uh, category, and uh, the maxes are three minutes, and it seems like three minutes is not very much time, but it's an eternity when you're trying to fly and get an airplane into a thermal. Um, the event right now has started to increase a little bit more, I think, at this last contest that we had down in uh, Lost Hills, and I'm not sure if you're familiar where that is, but if you're heading south on Interstate 5, about three hours south of San Jose, you come to Highway 46, which takes you to Wasco in one direction to the east, and then towards Paso Robles to the west. And Highway 46 and our flying site in Lost Hills is out there about five miles you know, west of, of Interstate 5. Again, you'll never see it from the highway, so that's the problem is that we don't get the exposure. You know, So the only way that you understand the hobby is by being involved in it over a particular period of time. Um, as a sidelight, this last February, we had 30 countries and over 250 contestants from these countries coming to Lost Hills. And what we've done is we've combined three major World Cup contests all within the duration of one week. So we have two weekends of flying, plus we have some international competitions that are happening uh, during midweek. Uh, obviously good for people that are retired, not so good for people that have to work. Uh, but it's gotten larger, and so the exposure is really what, what we're you know, seeing is better. And of course the Europeans, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Chinese, the Japanese, they come to this because they make a big vacation out of it. You, know, you can't think of any better place than, you know, to go, but in California, when it's winter everywhere else, and down here it's, it's really nice weather in February. Um, so where, where does this end up? Like, I know it's oriented to the wind, yes. the hill. Yes. So just, Go off basically, the yeah, uh, the best way I can describe it to you is, and it, uh, the ones that fly the other competitive events, which I'll explain to you also, is that this one here just seems like, well, what's the big deal about just tossing an airplane off of a hill? Well, it, it takes a lot more than just that. And you're absolutely right, Kyle. Um, you have to kind of pick when it is that you want to fly. You can actually piggyback or go at the same time somebody else is going, you know, or just after him or just before him. And, of course, you've got your own timers as well. Uh, but the trick is that, you know, sometimes what will happen, if it's not penetrating into the wind, 
What you don't want to have happen is this airplane starting to go out there and all of a sudden finding out that it's now what kind of weather vane there and all of a sudden it's starting to go backwards. And if it's going backwards, it's going to get on the other side of the hill and what happens on the other side of the hill? So you get that vortex you get and down it goes and you know almost immediately. You know, you're lucky if you get 20, 30 seconds or whatever. If it's really windy, there, there are two hooks here which allow you to put ballast under the CG. So we can increase more weight onto these airplanes. And that's what I also found out. As I was learning how to fly this particular event, I had to do that because all of a sudden I realized, you know, that I wasn't getting penetration. So then they're using um, the magnets, you know, that are used on, uh, not magnets, uh, the lead weights that are used on uh, uh, tires, you know, to balance them and everything mm -hmm. else because they have adhesive tape on them. And you can put that all under there. And I think what I had in my particular toolbox, I didn't have any lead weights like that. <laughs> But I had some kind of a punch, you know, a metal punch, and it looked kind of like a JTO bottle, you know. <laughs> so it felt heavy enough for me, so I just went ahead and stuck it on there. And then the guy started making comments. I said, "Okay, Fred, what'd you put on the bottom of that airplane? You got a rocket on the bottom of that thing? You push it forward." <laughs> <laughs> but it did. It added, you know, like another 11 ounces or so. Um, the so, other airplane so that does I it end up, pardon? Does it end up like it, thousands of feet in front of you, or? Uh, no, it, it just it just penetrates even better. Yeah, I mean that's what it does, and it's real. Uh, the other part of it, and maybe this is what you guys also know because you do fly off of off of hillsides and everything else with the RC airplanes. It's really a pleasure to see an airplane from above, you know, glide. You know, so when you're seeing it and you're timing and it's down there, and of course you have to keep an eye on it. And I, I set up a pair of uh, binoculars on a tripod because this thing gets out there far enough. And you've got a very, very thin profile. I mean, you'll actually lose it, you know, I mean, even in the binoculars. So we carry little tracking devices on them as well. And uh, it'll go at a particular frequency and it'll beep at you. And, of course, you have a line and everything else. And you go out there and you just follow your, you know, your tracking device to find your airplane. Um, if you have any questions, I can certainly answer so, them. So the idea is you're, you're picking your time. You think there's going to be a thermal out in front of you. Right. And you're throwing it. And what happens? One wingtip tries to pick uh, it up, and it tries to turn, but then the, the steering yeah, device if, if, turns it back into the thermal. Right. If, for example, if, if the thermal is creating something, you know, the thermal might not be exactly in line with where you're throwing it into sure. the wind, right? right? could be off to the side. And that's exactly what will happen. It'll kind of crab, right. and it'll even drop a wingtip or something. Right. And it'll do that, and it'll start going. It says, oh, my God, it's going off the line. You know, you think it's not going to recover. And then once it gets out there far enough, and all of a sudden, sure enough, that vein takes over, you uh -huh. know, and it brings it back into the proper lineup, mm -hmm. you know, and continues to make it going, you know, forward into the wind. Now, I saw a couple of... So it's not going to, obviously, it's not going to... It's not going to thermal. thermal. However, um, they, they are starting to come up with electronics. Now, we're not talking rate of control. We're talking about electronics, which makes an adjustment, you know, as the airplane gets out there far enough, and you know that you're, you're close to your maximum time, you know, of, of your three minutes or whatever it is, and they're making it so that the airplane will start to kind of circle back around so your chase isn't as far, you know, so it kind of comes back towards you. Mm. Uh, I'm not at that level at this point. Um, <laughs> and yes, uh, these airplanes, uh, in many cases, you have to buy them, you know, as opposed to making them. The key part, obviously, is that uh, the head there with the magnet, um, the rest of it, you know, there's components that you can make. In fact, we can even marry some of the wings for the F1A wings that I'll show you later into a smaller type glider. So we've got a couple of Swiss boys that came out here, and they had uh, electronics in their airplanes, and so they would give it a little bit of positive incidence on the tail, and then they would launch it like a javelin and throw it at that kind of an attitude, and then, of course, it would do an out, just a slight outside, you know, the beginning of an outside loop, and then at the proper time, the electrons would kick in to reset the right. negative incidence on your stabilizer for the glide. And so if they were getting more altitude from the hill that they were on, you know, and getting a little bit higher and doing actually very, very well at it. So there's different concepts. The one thing that they're not allowing with this event is to allow GPS. Um, there are guys that are thinking about maybe adding, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, gyroscope, mm -hmm. you know to maintain a little bit better heading mm -hmm. because the magnet, uh, you can actually see it better on this one here, there's a little canister, aluminum canister there that kind of dampens the effects of the magnet because without that aluminum canister, 
you know, it would be wobbling around too much, you know, not centering itself well, you know, to keep that vein more or less tracking on magnetic north or in the direction. Oh, the eddy currents in there keep it damp. Yeah, yeah, that's what dampens it. Yeah. yeah, and the the uh, the uh, hinge point rod that goes down and through the uh, magnet, you have a um, um, a jewel down there. It's like a ruby, whatever, really hard jewel, and of course it's a real sharp point. So you have very, very little, you know, uh, resistance and no friction, you know, so that the magnet is allowed to move, you know, freely. And you have to make certain adjustments every time that you fly because obviously, if the wind changes, you know, and you have to go up a different part of the hill, then you have to make the changes before you fly again. And some people sometimes make that mistake. Uh, I might add that uh, one of the things that also came out. <coughs> Of the activity over the last, um, let's say about the last 30 years approximately, let's just say around 1990, 1990, 1991, collapse of the Soviet Union. That's when a lot of things changed. All of a sudden we started seeing carbon fiber airplanes, carbon fiber Kevlar composites. Um, you can probably see that this timer here has that military looking anodizing to it. And sure enough, this was made by uh, uh, Russians. Um, the mechanical clockwork timer in here uh, is actually uh, the remnants of uh, Soviet uh, hand grenade uh, releases. <laughs> so they're, they're very good at updating you know, what they're going to use zillions of these timing devices for hand grenades into the hobby. You know? uh, very, very bizarre. Um, now, this airplane was good you know, for me to start with. Uh, obviously, I'm going to go the next step and start creating my own, you know, using different airfoils, uh, different uh, setups uh, that I can use, you know, that I have at home. Um, the other beauty about this particular category is that it's, in, it's designed, you know, so you can take it apart and so you can transport it, you know, on an airplane or whatever to go to a contest. So the wingtips actually come off, you take the adhesive tape off, and then the same thing with the fuselage here. Uh, you'll see that, you know, it obviously twists, you know, you can pull it off. Um, this particular one, I don't think the head comes off the, the front, uh, but then the stabilizer also will, uh, 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 can be pulled off. Uh, that's part of the dethermalizing device. So that, yeah, that hooks on, like that, oh, yeah, hooks onto the timer. So you can adjust it, you know, so that it goes, you know, for three minutes, five minutes, whatever. You know, if you have an extended max after having maxed out over seven rounds or five rounds, you can continue to increase it. The disadvantage of a mechanical timer is that it's mechanical, it's not precise, you know, um, and also the number of winds you can put into it, you probably can't get more than seven to eight minutes on it before it unwinds. Uh, with electronics, you know, it's endless. You can have it 10, 12, 15 minutes if you have to, continuing to go into your fly-offs. The next category, any questions? Any more questions on this one? Uh, the next one that I'm going to show you is called uh, <coughs> F1A, and again, we're talking about two airplanes here, two different styles. Um, this one here was made by a Ukrainian, this one was made by a Russian. Both of them are obsolete in terms of competitive flying, you know, today. Uh, the reason that they're obsolete is that um, they've gone, this one here has electronics in it, and it's adjustable to all sorts of varying degrees. It has one servo that allows about three or three different functions. Um, the um, the hook here can be captured, so you have a ring that goes on to your your tow line. The tow line has to be 50 meters long, no longer, and they ha you have to do a pull test. I forget exactly how many kilos or whatever it is, so that. The tow line will not go beyond 50 meters or 164 feet, um, you know, with, with the, the round amount of pull on it. Uh, so there is a certain amount of stretch, you know, so obviously it may be that your line is actually maybe less than 50 meters, you know, but by the time you pull it to test it and everything else, it, it winds up at 50 meters. Um, this particular one uh, unreleases at seven pounds of pull. So that means that by the tow ring that's attached to here, when, I, when I'm ready to release the airplane, I'm pulling seven pounds on there, but that doesn't mean that's all it is. When you actually release the airplane, because the line stays on there until you're ready to go, even though the capture arm has, has uh, flipped off, 
The guys that are flying today, they're putting close to 70 to 100 pounds of pull on these airplanes when they launch. So from a line that's 50 meters, if your airplane is up at 50 meters high, they can get 100 meters higher from the point of release of the airplane. It's an incredible acceleration. Uh, the airplanes that they're, or I should say the airfoil that they're using today, it's an LDA airfoil, um, low drag airfoil, I forget exactly who it is that uh, uh, came up with the design, it's, uh, I can't think of his name now. But it's, it has, it's not, I mean it's still cambered, but on the bottom part of the section it has a little bit more of a, um, what I would call like a, um, 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 it's not straight, it kind of goes down and then it goes back up again. Mm -hmm. Convex. Yeah, and it winds up being that with that airfoil, that's how they're getting you know the additional height. You do sacrifice a little bit in terms of lift, but altitude is king, you know. So if you can get the airplane up there high enough, the better chance you have of staying or finding another thermal after the one that you picked, you know, to uh, to fly in that particular round. Uh, again, as I said, this one here is electronic. It only has one servo. Uh, the servo does about three different functions. Um, when the airplane is towed straight, in other words, like you're taking it up, it's like a kite. So you see that the rudder, the mechanical side of it, straightens the rudder out. And so the airplane starts going up, and you get it up to the top of the line, and then you start to slacken the line. And so it starts going into a turn mode. And then you bring it around, it back into the wind, and then you start pulling on it again, and it starts going straight again like that. So you can continue to do that. It has a wing wiggler, which is also mechanically controlled in this particular this, this particular airplane, so that the wing wiggler allows your uh, inboard wing to drop a little bit, so it has a little bit of uh, inboard uh, wash in. And what that does is it increases the ability of the airplane to start turning around even a little bit quicker. And then as you start towing again, then the wing goes back up. So there's a little pin here that you know uh, attaches to the wing. And you can see that right here beside the wing wire, there's a little pin. And of course, that's what allows this particular wing to you know, go up or down a little bit. Upon release, that's when the electronic takes over. So now we've got the airplane kind of in that attitude. It's going up off the line increasing, the stabilizer is kicked over into a positive setting, which is basically creating an outside loop. But right at the, you know, at the point where the airplane is almost horizontal to the earth, then the next function kicks in, and this is, allows the airplane to go into its glide setting. And so it gives it a little bit more negative incidence. And now you're into your glide mode and your circle mode. Uh, and then the final function of the servo will be to bring this arm here back away from the stabilizer, which then allows it, the stabilizer to kick up at about a 45 degree angle to bring the airplane back down, basically dethermalizing the airplane out of your uh, out of the thermal. Um, the modern ones have about four servos, and they've got all sorts of different functions. Well, why? Well, because now they've come up with airplanes that uh, have a hinge the whole distance of the wing, you know, along here, which will allow it to flex, you know, and give you more camber or less camber. So at point of release, you're trying to make the air, airfoil almost as flat as possible to give it more height, and then once it gets up into its gliding mode, you know, the flat portion kicks in to give you more under camber and a better glide mode. Um, you can take a look at these. these this particular one is covered with um, uh, what's called Icarex, which is a, um, a ripstop material which is used, I guess, with uh, uh, competitive kite flying. So that's where the source is. It might even be in, in uh, sailboat to say as, as far as I know. And then I'll send you one of these two uncovered. You'll see that it's been sprayed on the top with uh, kind of a white or gray colored uh, uh, base paint. And that's really to reflect the sun because uh, a lot of the guys fly with all carbon, you know, and that black carbon gets really hot out there in the sun. Mm. Uh, but these things are almost bulletproof. I mean, uh, they're all set up in molds, you know. The, <laughs> if you don't have the amount of proper wash in or wash out on it, you know, that's the way it is, then the airplane or the wing may have to be thrown away, you know, because it doesn't have all the proper settings. Uh, but you can kind of take a look at this and get an idea of how 
you know, the, the balsa ribs in here are only there now to establish your airfoil. The rest of it is all, it's got carbon caps on top and bottom. And you've probably seen that in some of your larger blenders as well. But you can kind of get an idea, you know, what those things look like. And this one has a carbon Kevlar um, thread mm -hmm. taken around the spar. You'll see that as you uh, take a look at it down that way. So that one has a timer on it. This one here has a mechanical timer on it. And uh, if I have the right key or something here, I don't have enough strength, I think, to try and pull it down by myself. Let's see. Um, I should show you one of the stabilizers too that's uh, already uh, you have an idea what one of the stabilizers looks like for the one water. And this is for um, a similar glider but not here. No, I'm not going to be able to take it off, but basically um, um, you can see internally here the difference in the mechanics between this one and the, um, and the electronic model. Um, also, to give you an idea, even as strong as these wings are, and even the covering material, I've seen these things on launch. I swear, it looks like a compound bow, you know, with as much pull yeah. that's being established. They're like this, and you think, how does that thing hold together? Why isn't the covering material all coming off all the ribs? Yeah. You know, why isn't everything breaking apart? I have no idea. But that's but why you use that material rather than the, perhaps, rather than the... the I know what you're, yeah, what you're saying is that, I mean, there's all, a lot of different plastic film coverings that we use. Right. You know, we try and keep down the weight. In other words, we put the weight where the weight is needed, you know. So, uh, obviously, in the structure of the wings, very important. So we try and get the weight all forward. Same thing with the batteries, you know, all the electronics, everything else is up there in that pot. Um, covering material, this particular covering material is really good because number one, it's not porous, so you don't have to add a lot of dope or anything else, you know, to seal it up from uh, moisture, from water, or anything like that. Um, sometimes people prefer other materials, you know, like uh, polyspan is one of them. Obviously, uh, one time tissue, you know, silk skin, forget that, that's, that's old history stuff, you know. But it's, uh, it's really intended to do two things. One, to have not only a little bit of, um, uh, what do you call it, surface, um, uh, you want it a little bit rough. Uh, it works better than something that is too smooth. And in some, of the, some cases, the uh, turbulators uh, that are placed on there, and I'm not sure if that, if the one wing that you have over here somewhere is, yeah, is, has it or not. Yeah, this has a little red stripe. There you go. Yeah, yeah there's a turbulator on that one. You know, I don't I know if you one of those for a while. Okay, I don't know if you guys had a chance to see that or not. But, uh, it's like a thread. Yeah. Thick thread. Yeah, there's a thread there on the, on the front edge of it there. Yeah. Hey, Fred? Yes. I have a question. What's the significance of that model in the center section of the bike? That's just the way it came, you know. I call this airplane belly dancer, and there's a good reason why, you know. Yeah. So, I decided to leave it that way. And then while you guys are looking at that, I'm going to just throw one more thing here to you, because it just kind of gives you an idea of where things have gone. We keep thinking that we've reached the limits, and that's what free flight was really all about. We had the rules established at one time. They said, okay, well, gee whiz, you guys are still making maxes. You know, maybe we're going to have to shorten the line length. We're going to have to do something else, you know, so that you don't have such good performance. You know, they're trying to cut down the number of people that wind up in the flyoffs. Well, that's really where the contest is. You know, if you make those first five rounds or seven rounds as it was, 
now the contest really begins. You know, for us also Rams, you know, we drop one flight, you know, we're already out of it. So that's where the contest really, in a sense, begins. And um, so they've been trying to find ways of limiting performance. But every time they try and do that, these guys come up with other ways of, you know, either using yeah, those rules to improve the performance. And uh, I recall 20, 30 years ago, they said, can't get any better than that. I mean, you just can't. And all of a sudden we're saying, well, wait a minute, what happened to that pulse of trailing edge for crying out loud, <laughs> you know? So all of a sudden you have these little thin one-eighth inch carbon fiber trailing edges where before you try and launch an airplane like this, you know, back in those days, the wings would be sitting there fluttering, the whole covering material would come off, the airplane would break up in midair and whatever. And they're still breaking these things, you know. They still actually break these airplanes, you know, on launch. It's incredible. So now we're talking about something that maybe some of you guys had built years and years ago, you know, hand launch gliders. Um, this one is missing the rudder, but I just brought it just kind of to give you an example. Um, 24 inches was about the limit that I could throw a glider. In other words, the size of the glider. Uh, this particular one weighs uh, 43 grams and um, um, without the timer and all that stuff. And that was the classic way of how you launch these things way back in the day. And depending on whether you're left-handed or right-handed, you either put the grip on one side or the other. Sometimes guys would do it like this, come more like a baseball. Sometimes right-handers would prefer to have it on the other side. The whole trick, though, was to try and get the airplane to launch to the right of the wind and then to circle around to the left. That was pretty standard for a, a right-handed person. So this was a very, very standard size glider for somebody who had a pretty good arm. Uh, I haven't flown one of these things in a long time. Why? Because all of a sudden, it turns out, I forget how many years ago, the RC boys started coming out with discus launch gliders. And we said, whoa, look at how those, throwing those things way up there, you know, we couldn't believe it, you know. And we said, gee whiz, we got to figure out some way to, you know, take advantage of that, you know, technology. And uh, we found out several things. Keep in mind that our airplanes have to have all the things that you need built into it. Yeah, you can have a timer on there, you can have something that's going to just make some adjustments, you know, just like we do on the, on the F1A category. But basically, this thing has everything built into it. It has washout on the wingtips. Um, it has a deep DT mechanism to bring it back down. We found out that the T-tail style of tip launch or discus launch gliders wasn't working for us. So we had to figure out another way to get these things to fly properly. So it looks like it's pretty standard, but it isn't. When I show you this, this stabilizer is actually skewed to one side. So the rear end of it, where the V shapes onto the fuselage, is dead center. But on the other side of it here, it's off to one side, and there's a reason for that. Same thing with the rudder, and in fact part of the rudder got broken off, but it still flies really well. Note that the airplane has it's not quite 36 inches, maybe it's about 32 inches, I'm not exactly sure what. But, you know, in terms of the stabilizer size, it's about the same size as what we used to fly, you know, 30, 40 years ago. But look at the size of the airplane. Mm -hmm. This one here, I can't do it quite yet, but I'm learning. Uh, most of the guys can launch these up over 100 feet high. And that was never achievable with these things outdoors. And, you know, I mean, with the thermal, obviously, you're going to get a little bit more lift and stuff like that. But the real key for these things was, is having these adjustments made, you know, or built into the airplane already. So the difference between this and that is that now a right-hander is launching this thing, and it's being launched either in a 180-degree fashion into the wind, or you do a complete 360 to get more acceleration and, and letting it go. Your arm winds up being more like a golf club. You, you lock your, your elbow. You have absolutely no movement in that. So you're only holding it that, you know, with your wrist, and then you're using your torso and your body and your back to launch this thing. Now, it sounds like it's, you know, it's grueling. It isn't. It is so much easier on your arm than you would ever believe. I was, I was amazed. So the airplane, in this case, for a right-hander, is launched to the left. So it goes this way, and then it eventually reaches its apex up there, and then it turns around and starts colliding around to the right. And to achieve that, sometimes you have to add a little bit more ballast, you know, whether it's clay on the tip or something. 
Uh, there's also even a little wedge here. And that's important too because what that does is that keeps this wingtip up, you know, under acceleration, you know, so that there isn't a chance that you're going to get it to dive into the ground when it's getting ready to go into its gliding turn. Um, these are allowed to be one meter in span, so that's what, about 39 inches, I believe? And that's, that's pretty large, you know, but the guys are successful, you know, flying them that way. Um, anyway, this is a, a fun class. You get six chances to make three two-minute maxes. That's the way it is for AMA rules, Academy of Model Aeronautics rules. So that means that if you have achieved three maxes within six flights, you can continue. Obviously, if you continue to max out, you know, all six, then you just keep going in a series. You just keep going and going and going until you drop. They don't extend the max out, you know, to three minutes and four minutes and five minutes like they do in some other events. Uh, but it is such a basic uh, design, you know, um, most of them are all solid balsa wings, uh, probably sea grain wood, you know, for, uh, for better uh, strength uh, rather than A or, or B. Um, and then carbon, you know, uh, tapered booms are, are the norm nowadays. And so these things start looking, you know, a lot alike. So when you see them flying, you know, you don't see that variance that we used to see for year, you know, for many years. You know, of airplanes looking different. You know, they all look the same. They don't use carbon fiber or something in the wings. I'm sorry. Uh, well, actually, there is. There, I mean, in each one of those joints, and you probably can't see that because, especially under the on the black side of it, there's like. Either carbon fiber or plywood or something there to give it strength. Yeah. Especially on the wind that you're holding, because that's where all that force is. It needs to be solid, though, just to give it strength. Uh, there, are, there are built up airplanes as well. Yeah, there are built up airplanes yeah, with, with cutters and all of seems like this would be Yeah, like that. Yeah, okay. yeah very much so. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. In, in, going back to the uh, class with the, uh, the uh, magnet on the front, mm -hmm. has there been any uh, anyone who Used a uh, solid state uh, compass and you can control that to electronics and a servo to control the rudder instead of doing that. Yeah, there's, uh, there's two people, one from uh, New York named Bob Seifleet, and he goes way, way back in terms of free flight competition. He's been on world champs teams in many different categories. He's got to be in his early 80s now, and he's still flying and doing very, very well. And there's also a person by the name of Tom Yeager who lives in Henderson, Nevada. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the airplanes, you don't see this upper vein. You have you have a little black box sitting here, up here on top of the wing, you know, almost on the on the CG or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it and it does. It this has an electronic type compass. You can even couple the elevator a little bit. To, yeah, to yeah, it. yeah. They yeah they do they they, do they that. they've done that. So uh, that's what I'm saying is that the only thing that they're that the FAI has decided <coughs> not to allow is GPS because obviously mm -hmm. then. Now they have a much better chance of, of course, of doing whatever you know. So yes. they're they're limiting that, yeah. Uh, but people are starting to talk about uh, a little bit about the the gyroscope too. You know, these of course, with with that you could even, given the wind direction, you could program it initially, and then tell it, oh by the way, at the end of the three minutes, reverse that and That's turn right. it around and exactly, it. yeah. And again, I think the Europeans are at the forefront of a, of a lot they're of this because that's where it's all coming from, yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, really what it boils down to is that, unfortunately, you know, this category isn't that popular here yet. Mm -hmm. We've probably got only maybe 15, 20 people in the U.S. that are flying the event. Yeah. Um, and we hope to improve on that, you know. Uh, the other problem is flying sites. So, I mean, I know where you guys fly, you know, but the problem for us is that we have to have a way of retrieving. We have to be on some kind of a hill like a volcano, you know, where you have, where you have literally an unobstructed view of which direction the wind is coming from, you know, that kind of a deal. And you have to have access to the low ends. And the low end, exactly. exactly. Yeah, you got to stay away from them, them bulls, you know, all that kind of stuff, too. Yeah, no, there's, that's true. Yeah, so uh, we don't know where it's going to go, but um, uh, the rest of the hobby, you know, we, they keep saying, you know, the free flight is dying. And the problem, of course, is that as we get older, you know, and we just can't, you know, do the chase anymore. Or our vision goes bad, you know, or something else goes bad. So uh, that's really the limitation. Uh, we use uh, everything from uh, being on foot to bicycles, you know, off-road bikes to trail bikes, you know, motorcycles for retrieval. Um, uh, the, the, the one thing that is really important in a sense is to be able to go as far as the airplane does 
to retreat, you know. Um, the one good thing that they have established and allowed is to have what we call a radioactivated thermalizing device. So you can actually carry now a device which you can activate, you know, the control on the airplane when it's way up there, miles high. You already know that you've made your maximum flight, or it may take 30 seconds or a minute, you know, to come down from that thermal way up there, you know, and that cuts down on the on the uh, the distance of retrieval and or the loss of an airplane. Yeah, so uh, that's all you know, very very good. And also it's good too because sometimes you know, I mean, we're pilots, we make mistakes. You know, you put the wrong setting in there or something like that, and all of a sudden you launch it, and all of a sudden it's starting to zero in towards the ground. You say, oh gosh, you know, and you hit that button, you know, to save the airplane or people that might be on the ground. Um, so it's all about safety and trying to keep the airplane from getting broken as well. So anyway. Um, anything else I can tell you? So in the, uh, the magnetic vane type plane, mm -hmm. the adjustment is strictly aerodynamic. The vane doesn't do any adjustments of the flying surfaces? No, no, nothing else, yeah. Um, yeah, this is strictly for steering it basically in the direction that you want it to go. That's, that's all it is. Now, I did forget to mention that I saw a couple of flights this last February where these things were starting to crab, you know, almost parallel to where we were launching from, and they were going sideways, and I didn't understand why that was happening. You know, I just didn't, you know, it doesn't compute to me. I, you know, I keep thinking this, it should be going in the direction that you had it point. And then, sure enough, there would be like a ridge, almost like this, you know, it may be, uh, maybe this thing was 30 feet high, but we were up at maybe, uh, uh, 80 to 100 feet high, and the airplane would be tracking along, you know, going this way, and all of a sudden it would start swinging this way and losing elevation, and all of a sudden it would get ridge lift along this thing, and the airplane would follow this doggone ridge because there's air going up there, right? Mm -hmm. And it kept going the whole distance of it, you know, and then finally when that ridge, you know, evaporated or whatever, then the airplane all of a sudden had to kind of retrack itself in the direction that it was originally pointing in. So I thought, that's bizarre, you know? That is bizarre. So Very bizarre, yeah. And of course, we have no control over that, you know? We just let them go to wherever it is that they're supposed to. I might add, you know, that to me, one of the real fun parts of flying these F1As is that you really get that connection with the air that you're trying to get that airplane into. I call it reverse fishing. I literally call it reverse fishing because Two things that I do. The horn goes off at the beginning of the round. We either have 45 minutes or an hour for each round because obviously retrieval is part of it. And then you also have three or four other people on your pole positions and they have to be timed and all that kind of stuff as well. So I usually do not launch right as soon as that horn goes off. And you'll see the, the young guys you know, from all these different countries and they're out there and they're starting to circle and they're going around each other and trying to avoid line tangles. And they're stepping over things and whatever, you know, running this way and running that way. And I'm saying, says, you know, that's, that's insane. I think I'll wait till it calms down a little bit. Then what I do is I just go and I start towing up wind. I go way, way up wind away from everybody else. And I personally could care less if anybody else is going to pick my air. Because my whole objective is that I need to get my air, you know. So I go, I go uh, uh, upwind. And then I circle. And I keep circling and going around, and then sometimes you'll see the airplane just kind of doing this kind of thing. All of a sudden it's starting to kind of want to go in its own direction. So I go with it. I let the line out and I start running with it, and then all of a sudden it starts to tighten up and turn, you know. So then I says, okay, and then I start bringing in some line, getting the airplane up to the top, letting the line out as it goes downwind, and all of a sudden the airplane starts to tighten up. I says, oh, you know, that might be, that might be the fish that I'm looking for, you know. <laughs> so I'll feel it for about two or three turns, you know. And now I'm at the end of the line. You know, I'm holding onto the loop, and, and this line is up there in the airplane. saying, says, let go of me, let go of me, I'm in it, you know. So I'll bring it down for one more test. I'll get it down lower, kind of like this attitude. I'll bring it down, and it's going downwind, and it looks like it's going to crash into the ground. And then at the last minute, I'll bring it down around, and you can do it by keep tugging on the line. It kind of brings the airplane around. And then once it starts facing towards me, then I start running as fast as I can upwind again or um, opposite where, where I think the thermal is, and then I launch. And sure enough, it gets in there, and it just tightens up, and then it just starts going up. And so by the time it takes me to retrieve the line, get it back on the reel and everything else, I'm sitting there looking up at it, and it's, and it's just up there. You know, it's way up there. And um, 
you know, so then it's just that satisfaction. But it is, it's that connection. It's a beautiful connection just to feel that airplane tugging, you know, saying, says, I've, I've got the thermal for you. Come on, it's time to let go, you know, let it go. And Sometimes how, you make a miss, you know. How, how does the line get released? Um, yeah. Well, again, the line stays on the, on the fuselage. I don't know if you saw that. Um, the hook has a little keeper on there. And then there's a spring, and it takes seven pounds for that little keeper wire to come off. So the ring is still attached to the, to the airplane. Yes. Okay. But you've already committed yourself to launch. And I'm saying I'm committed because that's the way these airplanes are designed. The, the guys that are flying nowadays, if they think that they're ready to launch and all of a sudden they decide, uh oh, I'm not ready, you know, the thing will relatch itself, you know, through its electronics. So he doesn't have to launch with, you know, in the attitude that he thought was going to be right. And he, you know, he makes a mistake, he can save himself from that. Once I'm committed, you know, once that little wire comes off, I better launch because if I don't, it's going to come around and it's going to lose altitude and you're not going to get that nice, you know, uh, altitude that you had, you know, when you first felt it. But you're absolutely right. The, the line stays on that ring and on the hook until such time that you're ready to let go of it. And so when you do, when you're ready to launch and it's at its apex, you know, you just let go of the line. The line bounces off the hook. You know, and then falls, and there's a flag. Oh, oh okay. so a flag. you have to go with the line. You remove your tension of the line, and it releases. Exactly. I guess I didn't yeah, make no, that that's clear. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 It used to be that we kept them on the reel. You know, we used to fly them with the reel, but then uh, they started saying, "says You know, that's dangerous." You know, because if if the reel is still on the airplane or whatever, and the re you know the reel is on attached to the line, it's liable to hit somebody. You know, on its way down or whatever. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Yes. The uh, first, I would say about the first um, 10 meters of the line is fairly thick. It's usually um, um, a woven type, you know, a Dacron type fishing line, and they usually have a loop on the end of it. Um, then the remainder of the line is either monofilament or what they call, they call it Russian rod, which I'm not sure what kind of uh, material it is. I mean, they've used spectra, they've used all sorts of different kinds of uh, of exotic uh, fishing lines and, and other types of lines. Kevlar would be great. Kevlar, you know, another one. Yeah. Uh, two things. Monofilament obviously curls an awful lot. Yes. So when you're reeling it up on your reel, now you got a bunch of coils. And there's been times, you know, where I've been caught and other people have been caught, you know, with too much slack, you know, around your feet. And you're trying to get away from that. You're trying to get away from the, uh, uh, what do you call those darn things? Tumbleweeds, you know. <laughs> Tumbleweeds are starting to grab the line. And your airplane's up there, and you see that you've got a knot down there. You're trying to undo that while you know you have slack on the line or whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it's important you know that you have some control over the process. So that's why people prefer to have braided line, you know, than uh, monofilament. But you'll also see that these guys will take that. You know, they'll have their timer holder, helper, or whatever. He's holding onto the airplane, you know, tightly, and the, the sportsman is pulling back on that line and stretching and stretching as much as he can to take as much of the coil, you know, out of the, out of the, uh, out of the line uh, before he launches. It's kind of gives us a set or whatever, you know. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a fun hobby. Um, I'll probably do it, you know, until uh, I can't run anymore or anything. You know, I think Noel already knows, you know, that I went through knee surgery, so I had to do kind of do some recuperation. Got to lose a little bit more weight because I find that you know if I'm huffing and puffing out there, I'm not going to be able to keep up with some of these guys. But it's still fun. Yeah. You have any place around here that you fly? Uh, it's the only place you can fly. Yeah, yeah we do. Fun. In fact, uh, our big contest comes up the weekend after next. It's called the Northern California Free Flight Championships, and it's held up near Sacramento. So I guess the best way to tell you where it is, it's off of uh, in Rancho Cordova. If you know where Sunrise Boulevard, south of Highway 50, is and where Jackson Road or Jackson Highway intersects Sunrise Boulevard. So it's just a little south of, um, of uh, Highway 50, uh, near Mather Air Force Base, or what used to be Mather Air Force Base, and we've been flying there since the, the late 50s, early 60s. Is that Wagel? That's Wagel Field, yeah. A lot of RC old timers used to fly there as well, but uh, the problem that we've had even with that flying site is that there's been encroachment you know, with more housing developments. And also, there's more traffic. You know, people are using Sunrise Boulevard, you know, either to go to work or to come home. You know, so it gets more traffic. So we do have a problem with possible overflying. You know, those areas. You know, 
And again, that's where the RDT system is helpful, you know, because if you can bring the airplane down away from the, the roads, trees, houses, things like that, then you save your airplane. So, anyway. That's right. pretty much Thank it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.